Please watch this film clip, and I'll be with you in a few moments.
You've just watched what is probably the most famous sequence in the history of cinema, namely the Odessa Steppe sequence from Sergei Eisenstein's 1925 film, Battleship Potemkin. Eisenstein's movie takes place in 1905, which is the year of an abortive revolution in Russia, um, a revolution against the czarist regime in which workers went on strike in the major cities of Russia and um, members of the Russian military began to rebel against their officers. Battleship Potemkin, the film, is about a mutiny that takes place during the 1905 revolution on the battleship Potemkin. The circumstances of the Odessa steppes sequence are the following. The people of Odessa have come down to the wharf in order to greet the, the mutinous sailors and to send provisions out to them on their small boats. As in, they're in the process of doing this, the um, troops of the czarist regime attack them from the rear. And so we see the czarist um, Cossack army troops marching down the steps and firing into the crowd of people as the crowd seeks to flee. Now what makes this sequence so significant in the history of cinema is not just its dramatic power, um, the power of depicting a massacre of civilians. It's also and primarily the way into which Eisenstein films that massacre. And he does it through um, his use of a technique known as montage. In general, montage is a post-production process. It's a process that occurs after a film has been shot. In montage, a filmmaker cuts film footage up into segments and then recombines those segments in meaningful and often jarring ways. So, for example, consider the way that Eisenstein handles the depiction of the trampling of the child in the Odessa Steps sequence. And he doesn't show us the um, trampling in continuous fashion. He breaks the scene of trampling up into fragments. So we see the child initially walking with its mother, and then it loses its mother's hand and falls on the steps. But then the camera cuts to images, not of the child, but of the entire crowd stampeding down the steps, then to images of the child, then to a shot of the mother's face, back to a shot of the child, back to, sh to shots of the crowd trampling, a, sh a close-up shot of the child, um, the hand of the child being stepped on by the panicked crowd, and so on. This particular montage of the child being trampled is a part of a larger pattern of montage that runs through the Odessa Steps sequence as a whole. That more comprehensive pattern of montage concerns the conflict between the Tsar's troops and the people of Odessa. In other words, the conflict between the Tsar's regime and the ordinary workers and sailors whom they support. That conflict, of course, is the one that drives the 1905 revolution as a whole. And although it finds no definitive resolution at the end of 1905, because, of course, that revolution was abortive, it failed, it is um, recreated in the revolution of 1917, which was ultimately successful and ultimately led to the triumph of the Bolshevik party and their achievement of state power. Now, Eisenstein was explicitly allied with the Bolshevik regime. He did not see himself as a politically neutral artist. He was an artist who was in ser the service of the revolution, so to speak. And in this, he was not unique. Eisenstein was one of many avant-garde filmmakers. Filmmakers who used aesthetically advanced techniques, like the technique of montage, and did so because they believed that the revolutionary transformation of culture was a part of the larger revolutionary process um, as a totality. They were doing, on the level of art, what Lenin and the Bolsheviks had done on the level of politics, namely they were turning society 
upside down. In his writings on the aesthetics of cinema, Eisenstein developed a theory of what he called dialectical montage, which for him was part of a larger dialectical theory of cinema. What is dialectic? Well, the concept of dialectic emerges in the work of Hegel and of Hegel's heretical student Karl Marx, who, of course, um, inspired the Russian revolutionaries. For Hegel, dialectic refers to the process through which reality develops itself by passing through contradictory conflicts and then overcoming those conflicts on higher levels of expression. For Hegel, reality is something that is fundamentally in process. And in order to understand process, we need to understand those moments of conflict that development is meant to resolve. Now Marx took, on, took over Hegel's theory of dialectical development and he applied it to the analysis of the new capitalist society that had arisen at the time that Marx came onto the scene. He applied the notion of dialectical development, development through the resolution of contradictory conflict to the um, relations between capitalists and workers in capitalist society, to the relations between what he called the forces of production and the relations of production, and in general interpreted capitalism as a social form that was destined to give way to a new society. In other words, capitalism was not eternal, as many of its um, apologists had claimed. It was a transitory phenomenon, and to the extent that we are able to understand the nature of that transitory phenomenon, we're able to steer it in the direction of a fully human society. The Russians, as I said, took their general concept of dialectic from Marx and applied it politically and economically. Eisenstein did the same thing on the level of, of art and of cinema in particular. In this class, we're going to be looking at Eisenstein's work, but not at Eisenstein's work alone. We're also going to be analyzing the work of three other great representatives of the Soviet avant-garde film, Ziga Vertov, Vesvalad Padovkin, and Alexander Dovzhenko. In the process, we're going to try to understand the nature and significance of a revolutionary dialectical cinema. Well, um, that's it for this little introductory video. Um, I'll see you on Blackboard. Bye now.